As we were having the debate on the floor, one of my colleagues, and I'll never forget this, one of my colleagues got up on the other side, of course, got up and said, quote, school shootings are here to stay and they're not going anywhere. So that's the attitude and the mentality, you yeah. know what I mean, that we're dealing with. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, you're rocking with a goat. Ken Dow giving you motivation for growth. Two toes down, he keep it realer than most. He do it for the culture, that's always the goal. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. Today we're going to get some of those answers about what the hell do they do. We're going to get those answers from none other than our own state representative. His name is Terrence Upchurch. He is the state representative for the 10th House District. 10th House District. Terrence Upchurch. Welcome yes, to the show. Thanks for having me, brother. Glad to be here. All right. So, Terrence, you know, Representative Upchurch, we're going to call you by your name because that's who you are. You <laughs> earned the title. You won an election and you got people to vote for you. Tell us, where are you from, Terrence? Representative, see, I messed that up again. Well, you know, where Terrence is cool, brother. You know, you can call me Terrence, yeah. but I'm from Cleveland, northeast side of Cleveland. Grew up in the Collinwood neighborhood, still live there today. Bought my first home in the Collinwood neighborhood, so I'm homegrown. I got a bachelor's degree from Cleveland State University, so I stayed local. Okay. What high school you went to? Now, I went to St. Peter Chanel. Uh, it was in Bedford, across the street from uh, Bedford right. School. My son went to that school. It's a good school. Yeah. Boy, it was a good it school. It was a good school. Yeah. They closed it. They did. Yeah. They closed it, and I think it just got torn down mm -hmm. about two years ago. Yeah. My son was going there. He went to Maple Heights. Okay. And Maple Heights had a Ed Choice program. Okay. That, you know, leading out of, I think it was middle school going into high school, mm -hmm. they had an opportunity to be able to utilize the Ed Choice voucher because the high school just wasn't meeting the grades that okay. the state was putting out there for you to go there. And in that process of him going through that, it was a big thing at the school, man. A lot of the parents who was paying parents, I guess you could say, but everybody are paying parents, but they felt that we were using our money and mainly were a lot of the white parents that were there. They were having a serious problem with that, man. They didn't like that at all. So Yeah, I mean, listen, that's not a surprise at all. You know, mm -hmm. my mother paid for my tuition, but I can certainly imagine where some folks would feel like they're getting the short end of the stick for helping other people that come from less fortunate areas. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But how are they helping them? an opportunity to come to a school where otherwise they wouldn't be able to come to if their parents couldn't afford the tuition. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? But they were using this. Now, but, I guess the argument was that it was still tax dollars. Right, right. Right? The fairness was that the discount that they were getting should have been spread it across mm -hmm. so that everybody else should have been able to. But the cost of education, which is another show and a whole other issue we talk about, That's is right. very, very expensive. And to that point, you know, I think it's costing almost $40,000 a year to fund a student in public schools and Yep. Hell, you can go almost to any private educated place or any private institution and be able to get top-notch education for that. So it makes no sense why our kids are still failing in public I schools. I know. So talking about state representative, what is a state representative? Well, the biggest part of my job is, one, passing laws, and two, advocating for state dollars. Think of me like a member of Congress, but at the state level. We've got uh, a House of Representatives, and we've also got a Senate. In the same way that a bill becomes law at the federal level, it's the same way the state level. So a bill has to pass through both chambers, the House and the Senate, and it has to be signed into law by the executive, which in this case would be the governor. So think of every state like a small country. Mm -hmm. The setup is very similar. Every state has two legislative chambers, and every state has an executive. So they got the thing that's School of Rock. I'm just a bill. Yeah. So I guess that's basically what we're talking about again, you know, yeah. trying to turn a bill into a law. That's right. right. That's, that's right. right. So tell me, how long you been in office? I've been in office since January 2019, so just a little over three years. And so you're running for re-election? Running for re-election. I'm running in a new district. We just went through a redistricting process, which was quite interesting, I'll say. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be representing the 10th House District. I'll be running for re-election to the 20th House District. We'll talk a little bit about that. What happened? Why is this redistricting taking place? Why are we having an election in August when we just had an election in May? And we never had an election for these type of position in midterms, and that's where we are now. So why are we just now having this election? 
The reason why we have redistricting is because every 10 years we go through a census. After the census, we see our population fluctuate. It may go up and it'll go down, which is what we've seen. And then after we have the census, we have to go through redistricting. And we redraw the districts, the House of Representatives and the Senate. You go through both legislative chambers and you do redistricting. And we also do it at the federal level too. State legislature is responsible for drawing congressional districts, state house districts, and state senate districts. Okay. Now, I think if I were a gambling man, I would say the reason why this particular redistricting was so disastrous was because of the internal politics that were at play. You have a state legislature that is controlled by a very, very partisan and radical extreme Republican Party. And the numbers are so disproportionate. I believe that this was all done by design to allow those that have the majority to maintain their majority and make their majority even stronger. Mm. I think the ratio in the House right now is Republicans have over 60 seats. Wow. Okay. And they have drawn the districts to where after this election, they're going to have almost 70 seats. Really? And for them to have almost 70 seats, well, what does that do to the Democratic caucus? It shrinks it. They've packed districts. We've got incumbents primarying each other. If you look at what's happened on the West side, two of my colleagues that are incumbents are in a primary against one another. And who is those? Monique Smith and Brian Sweeney. Mm. There's no reason that that should happen, but that's because they drew the districts that way. They drew the districts that way. It was all done by design. On the Senate side, if you look at Cuyahoga County, for the first time in, as I understand, 50 years, we're going to lose an African-American state senator. The Honorable Sandra Williams was the state senator for the majority of Cleveland. It's now Dale Martin. But that Senate seat is being dissolved. They literally split that Senate seat in half. So the west side will go with Nikki Antonio, and then the east side of that district is going to go with either Kent Smith or John Barnes. And let me just say this. I think Nikki's going to do a fantastic job as state senator, and whether we have Kent Smith or John Barnes, I think we'll have effective representation on that end. But the bottom line is, when you look at Cuyahoga County, there should be a west side state senate district, a Cleveland state senate district, and an east side state senate district. And why that is so difficult for the folks that have the pen to understand is just beyond me. But so the African Americans won't have any representation on the Senate side, is what we're saying. Unless John Barnes wins, we will not have a African American state senator from Cuyahoga County. Interesting. Which, which as I understand is unprecedented. And I've talked to folks that have held public office that have been around longer than me, you know, that have never seen anything like this before. But is it possible to win the Nikki Antonio seat? Is it possible that African American could win if they ran in that seat? Let's really talk about it. And that's what my show is all about. Sure. We, you know, we don't sure. bull crap. So, I mean, it can't happen. Could an African American win that seat? Well, anything, listen, anything's possible. After this country elected Donald Trump president, I will say anything is possible in politics, right? But you have to look at the demographics of that district. You're talking about Parma, which is a large area, heavy voter turnout, the far west side of Cleveland. And I'm not sure, I would have to look at numbers to see how African-American candidates play in those parts. I'm not really sure. W which part of that is east side? Well, there is a, a portion of the east side of Cleveland that's in that Senate district. You've got parts of Ward 5, parts of Ward 7, Ward 8, Ward 10. East Cleveland? East Cleveland's going to go in the eastern state Senate district. But Shaker, Cleveland Heights? Shaker and Cleveland Heights, as I understand, is going to go in that eastern Senate district also. But here's, Really? Yeah, here's the challenge, Kenny. You've got places like Parma, the far west side of Cleveland, that have heavy voter turnout. Oh, no, they, I get you know, it. Yeah. And those yeah. parts may outvote yeah. the east side. Oh, no, without a doubt they will. That's I, why I was mentioning, I was wondering, did you get any of the bigger ones, like maybe a Cleveland Heights or a Shaker that sure. might boost that up? But if they're not even in that, and if it's just, what you saying, Ward 5. <laughs> Ward 5, 6, 7. And don't, and don't get me wrong, I think. Yeah, you know, those are very low areas of right. turnout for African Americans in the inner city. Right. Now, the good thing is, what I'm optimistic about is we have council people in those areas that mm -hmm. have really done the work to push the vote out. Mm -hmm. You look at what Richard Starr has done, I mean, it's it's amazing. I mean, he mm -hmm. has literally, you know, put his boots on the ground to mm -hmm. increase voter turnout. You know, if you look at the 2017 election versus 2021, you'll see an increase in voter turnout. I think Stephanie House has also done a very good job of putting boots on the ground, doing the grassroots work to increase the voter turnout Ward 7. Mm -hmm. So I'm optimistic because we have the leadership in these wards that are folks that are willing to do the work to increase voter turnout. But it's not going to be enough. I don't know if it's going to be enough to overtake Parma, Lakewood, the far west side of Cleveland. <laughs> but again, that's the reality of the situation. And this is what was done by design. This is what the Republicans wanted. Look at my district, the 10th House District and the proposed 20th House District. Okay. Look almost identical. 
except for there was a line drawn right down Mike Palenzik's ward and Anthony Harrison's ward. Half of that ward is going to go in one house district, and mm. the other half is going in another house district. Okay, So essentially, I was drawn into that house district with parts of Ward 10, parts of Ward 8, Lynnhurst, Richmond Heights, that I have never represented and I've never ran in these areas. Obviously, they have their own unique issues, and I'm not accustomed to them because I'm not familiar with those areas. I had to do like some folks had to do that are incumbents move into other districts to run. So I chose to move back into the 20th House District because it looks identical to the 10th House District. There's parts of Ward 8, parts of Ward 10, all of Ward 9 is in there, parts of Ward 7. Well, now it's all of Ward 7. Downtown Cleveland, which is where I represent right now, parts of Ward 3. It looks virtually identical to the 10th House District. That's interesting, man, because, you know, something would have to be done because it sounds like you're saying you would never have a state senator in that room. And the way that, as I understand, because we ended up the way we ended up, these districts are only going to be for two years. And then we do the process all the over process again. The process all over again. Yeah. On that note, with, as it relates to that, I was talking with somebody, and I totally agree with you on the Republicans did this by design. And I think the design of it was not just in the fact that they wanted to do something with the suppressing these districts, but also suppressing the vote for these Absolutely. midterms as well. If you look at the number of voter turnout across the state of Ohio being at on most average, and you're saying Lawrence County, the big C's, they were at like 20% voter turnout. And I know everybody gave Chantel some grief about Cuyahoga County, but believe it or not, Cuyahoga County outvoted most of the other counties across the state. And Cuyahoga County was at a low of like 20, 21 percent. So with that being the case, you know, I believe that they did a very, very, very good job of suppressing the votes in the primary and confusing African-Americans and minorities in of these course. areas. Already the apathy was there as it relates to voting anyway. And for them to kick all of this stuff in to give us what we got three elections all back to back the way it's going down I don't think nobody is going to be on it and unfortunate for you guys you got an election coming up in August and I don't know what the turnout is going to be in that we're looking at 10 percent turnout 20 percent we'll turnout. we get 10 percent I mean and you've seen this it's bad enough that the voter turnout is already low especially with state house races mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now we're talking about a special election right for state house races correct so the voter turnout was already going to be low. But now we've pushed the election date back. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks that don't even know about. Exactly. You know, exactly. So of course it was done by design. And then I think that that's just going to carry over to the general election. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have statewide races. Nan Whaley and Cheryl Stevens are on the ballot. I think that's part of the design. It just, just helps their agenda and helps them consolidate their power. Oh, it was serious voter suppression. I mean, they really did it in Ohio where they did this whole voter thing coming up, we really screwed up. Yeah, know? I'm a Democrat, and I'm part of the Democratic caucus, and I, I would hope that at some point our party begins to move to move forward and together as a mm -hmm. unit. I think while we're having our internal discussions about which way to take the party, they're on the other side busy and moving their chess pieces, mm -hmm. and we're losing ground. Yeah, that, that's happening all the time, and let's talk about a few of those pieces they put it on the board. Let's we'll start off with the guns, because that's the biggest thing. You, you know, your governor went ahead and put some new legislation out there that made it even easier yeah. for anybody now to carry a gun. Now, I'm a little conflicted on that one. Some people are saying, oh, they made it easier. Everybody now don't need a permit to carry a gun, but the people that you really worry about never had a damn permit anyway and they wasn't going through none of those classes in the first place i saw a video councilman jones showed me yesterday some kids made here in cleveland some video and it was about 15 of them and all of them had guns all of them had guns yeah. you seen that video man it's crazy and they was doing this hip-hop song and they all was talking about these bodies and it was just real crazy yeah. but they all had guns and it was right here in cleveland and, and on one of the housing units j housing mm -hmm. and it was in one of those units and with that being the case those are not the guys i think that dewine and everybody are saying oh you're making it easier for those kids don't have 
no permit, was never thinking about getting a permit. And if they told them, if they could walk in a place and they told them they can have it and they need to fill out this paper to get it, they yeah. wouldn't do it anyway. Right. That ain't what they're there for. Right. So with that being the case, what are you guys doing down there to try to help fight? I know it was much you can do because you told me number-wise you guys are right. out numbers. How do you go to work every day knowing that you can't win? Well, this is an election year, and I do want folks to know that if what is happening does not motivate you to vote, I don't know what will. Every controversial and harmful bill that has a negative impact or that has had a negative impact on our communities, our governor has signed into law without hesitation, and he is going to continue to do it. And I know him personally. He is a very nice old man, but his politics it sucks. Yeah, you know, his <laughs> belief on certain things, it's detrimental and it's harmful. And he's going to continue to sign these harmful bills into law without hesitation. Now, to your question about what did we do as a Democratic caucus, I think that a lot of my colleagues in my caucus will agree. Unfortunately, we don't have the numbers to vote down some of these harmful bills. Mm -hmm. However, if we use our seats as platforms to educate, mm -hmm. inform, and motivate people, I think that's where we can begin to cut away at their stronghold by enlightening people and educating people and reporting back a harmful legislation that's coming out of the state house. You know, I think that motivates people to get involved, want to vote and get others registered to vote because if something doesn't affect you directly, you're less inclined to pay attention to it. But if you can draw a correlation between a bad bill that comes out of the state house and how it impacts your life directly and your safety directly, you're going to be motivated to do something. And I think we're able to do that by using our office and our positions as platforms to enlighten and educate people that we represent. Mm. So this bill that he put out there as far as teachers being able to have us in school, what's your thoughts on that? It was crazy. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. And we had a debate on the floor about the bill that would allow teachers to carry guns. The sponsor of the bill couldn't answer any questions. And I want to commend my colleague, Representative Geralds out of Columbus. He asked the sponsor a simple question about liability. And the sponsor couldn't even answer the question. And this is what I'm talking about. They're mm -hmm. introducing bills that are so bad and so dangerous, they don't even know what's in them. Wow. And if we dig deeper, these conservative think tanks, they go across the country to different state legislatures mm -hmm. and introduce these same bills. You know, there's a bill similar to this bill in other states, mm -hmm. just like there's heartbeat bills in other states. Mm -hmm. You ever heard that phrase, the devil's busy? Right. They're strategic and they're busy. They're going around to different state legislatures introducing these harmful bills and trying to change the culture and just trying to change the way of thinking and just trying to make life difficult for certain people. It's scary. What was the attitude or the mood down there when that Roe versus Wade came across and then he turned around and signed that heartbeat bill? It was heartbreaking because we have come so far, and this ruling was law of the land for 50-plus years, mm -hmm. and there have been so many efforts to cut away it and make abortion access more and more difficult and take away women's rights to choose about their reproductive rights. And they were finally able to accomplish what they had been trying to accomplish for so many years. I mean, it was demoralizing. Mm. But we cannot feel defeated. That has to motivate us to go to work. And this is a direct reflection of elections having consequences. When Donald Trump was president, he was able to get three Supreme Court picks. Mm -hmm. Those picks are the ones who voted to overturn Roe v. Wade. Correct. Even though he was president for four years and his policies may not be detrimental for generations, that Supreme Court ruling is going to be detrimental for generations, and the court is gone forever. So I'll give you a strategic move. Here goes my strategic okay. move for you guys. Do you think it's possible that you guys can start a bill that can possibly look at challenging this heartbeat bill? Put another one out that basically is going to say we are against the Roe v. Wade decision and get that out and allow the voters to kind of make a decision on whether or not that decision should be made. Sure, like a ballot initiative or something? Yeah. Yeah. I think you should do it because the momentum right now is out there for mm -hmm. that. I think you can raise millions of dollars to do the effort. I think that it will inspire people in the community to get the base back going. Yeah. And I think it'll give us an opportunity to be able to do better in the midterms this November election. It may not even get, as you say, on the floor. It may not even go nowhere yeah. because of that. But the momentum, the opportunity, because what we kept talking about is that how are you going to get people to vote 
unless it's something that truly affects them right away. Yeah. So to be able to put that out there, to be able to do that in compass with like the gun bill and the heartbeat bill, to some degree, knowing, and it's like I said, it's all a strategic move, knowing that it may not go too far, but sure. it may galvanize your base, may be an opportunity for you guys to do something. Absolutely. Listen, I think where we are right now as a state and where we are as a country right now, I think mm -hmm. we need to exhaust all our resources and mm -hmm. we need to throw the kitchen sink at the other side and try every trick in the book. Mm -hmm. Because something's going to stick, you know what I mean? Some I think something's, gonna, or something at least is going to light that spark mm -hmm. to get something going. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. Your legislation you tried to do with marijuana, right? Now yeah. let's talk about that and your view of that. You wanted to legalize marijuana. We wanted to legalize marijuana recreationally. We wanted to expand the medicinal program. And we also wanted to begin to expunge some of these records for these low-level marijuana convictions that have been holding people back from mm -hmm. continuing their lives and being productive citizens for so long. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Michigan's marijuana program, it's effective. It works. It has increased their revenue. I think they're bringing in well over $16 million quarterly or something like that. I need to go look at the specifics again, mm -hmm. but their formula works and it's generating additional revenue, okay? Mm -hmm. And just think about what we can do with the additional revenue that we bring in here to the state of Ohio. We have cut away at local government funding, mm -hmm. okay? Essentially, the, there should be a, a relationship between state and local government, but because we have cut away local government funding, we've made it hard for our mayor to do his job. We haven't just made it hard for our mayor to keep our streets safe. We've, mm -hmm. we've made it hard for our mayor to create economic opportunity. Right. Uh, so I think legalizing marijuana is an economic driver, and it's another opportunity for us to bring additional revenue into the state of Ohio. Now, the unfortunate thing is, again, looking at the dynamic of the state house, mm -hmm. if we are able to legalize it and bring mm -hmm. that additional revenue into the state, I don't trust that the other side is going to spend it properly. You know what I mean? I don't right. trust that they're going to mm -hmm. use it to go to local governments or go to public schools, which is in the bill that Representative Weinstein and I introduced. Mm -hmm. Well, that can be controlled, though, right? They have to use the money for what they said. Right? Can y'all keep a track of that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You just don't trust they're going to do it. I don't know. trust that they'll do it. That's right. <laughs> so what happened with that? You know, Kenny, I think like any other bill that is good for Ohio, it was publicity. It's good press because Rep Weinstein and I, we started the conversation and we continued the conversation. But I just think right now we're in a space where there are folks on the other side and not all the members of the majority, because there are some members of the majority that want to see this happen. The Republicans actually have a legalization mm -hmm. bill that also has not went anywhere. But I just think leadership on their side is just not ready for it and they don't want it. The speaker has not assigned these bills to committees. That there has Well, Rep. Weinstein's bill, and my bill with Rep. Weinstein has been assigned to the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. but we haven't had a hearing. I don't know where Rep. Calendar's bill has been assigned, who is the Republican who has a legalization bill. I don't know what committee his bill has been assigned to, but I can tell you it hasn't had a hearing. So you got some bipartisan support on this. I wouldn't say bipartisan support. I would say that at least as far as the legislature, we don't have any Republican co-sponsors on our bill. It's all members of our caucus. Now, the Republicans have their own bill. It still remains a partisan issue because each caucus has their own bill. And Rep. Weinstein and I are not going to go support Rep. Callender's bill if he's not going to do the same thing in return. Mm -hmm. You know what? I mean, what good is that going to do? Right. Right. And I think that's how you demonstrate real bipartisanship. If they come on and co-sponsor our bill because we introduced our bill first, I'm sure we would be open to taking a look at their bill and seeing if it would be something that we would be willing to co-sponsor or not. Or having both caucuses come together and look at both of our bills and have a discussion and take the good in both of our bills and draft a new bill and maybe have one D on it and one R on it. Hmm. So let me ask you this, man. What's been some of the most surprising things you've seen happen since you've been down there? Like, damn, I don't believe they actually did that. Oh, the gun bills. I'll tell you, the one allowing the teachers to carry the handguns, that just blew me. And there are so-called religious folks mm -hmm. on their side. And I'm just like, you really trust someone other than law enforcement to have a gun in the school? Right. And as we were having the debate on the floor, one of my colleagues, and I'll never forget this, one of my colleagues got up on the other side, of course, got up and said, quote, school shootings are here to stay and they're not going anywhere. Mm. So that's the attitude and the mentality that we're dealing with. Mm. You know, it's just closed minded. Wow. And you would think most of these shootings are happening in these suburban areas. Rural suburban areas. Rural areas. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm trying to get. Yeah. Yeah. So you would think that they would want tighter restrictions on that because out there you can walk around with your gun because you'd be out there hunting or whatnot. But right. I just don't get that at all. Yeah. yeah. I just think about when I was in grade school 
And I think we've all had moments where we were difficult as children. Mm -hmm. I can think of times where me and my friends drove our grade school teachers crazy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they would come into school and they'd be having a bad day or something bad Mm -hmm. happened Mm -hmm. at home. And, you know, we're all human. So sometimes you carry that to the workplace. And just imagine if you're in that headspace and you step and the wrong student says the wrong thing to you on the wrong day and you snap. Who knows what could happen? It's just not healthy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So let me ask you also, Terrence, so what direction you want to go in the future here, man? If you're doing the state rep thing, you got another term or so you can run and do that. But what do you like to see with this new mayor? You got a new county executive coming mm-hmm. in. So I'm in term two. I've got two more terms left. God mm-hmm. willing, I'm able to be reelected and serve and finish out. Mm-hmm. I've never been one of those folks that always had to stay in elected office. Mm-hmm. You know, I enjoy the work that I do. I was talking to former councilman Bashir Jones one time, man, mm-hmm. and he said something to me that stuck with me. I asked him, why are you running for mayor after one term, bro? And he said, I said from the get-go, I wanted to come in, make my mark, and move on to the next thing mm-hmm. and let somebody else come along. And that's kind of where I'm at, too. If something else opens up, we'll see. But I'm content with coming in, doing what I can in the state house, knowing that I fought for my district. I'm content with that and then moving on to the next thing. As far as the current leadership in our city, we've got a very strong mayor. We've got a very good county executive that's coming in. You know, I think we've got an effective congresswoman, and I think the three of them can work together and build synergy for Northeastern Ohio, regardless of the nonsense and foolishness coming out of the state house. So I'm optimistic for the future of Northeast Ohio with the leadership that we have. And however, the three of them need me to help in my capacity to be supportive. I'm going to always be here. So tell me, what's your passion? What is the thing you're passionate about? You know, I love government, not so much the politics side, but mm-hmm. just government itself using government as a tool to improve the quality of life. You know, that's what I'm passionate about. And, you know, whether it's being on the elected side or being on the bureaucratic side, I'm very passionate about effective government because I have seen where effective government can create opportunities and give people extra step they need to go to the next level. I can remember being a kid and listening to my grandfather tell me about his father, my great grandfather, standing in those soup kitchens or those mm-hmm. soup lines during the Great Depression, and how the New Deal was policy from the government that had a direct impact on the quality of life of their family. Mm-hmm. My grandfather had uh, seven sisters and six brothers. Okay, and we're talking in the 30s and 40s. I mean, mm-hmm. and he would always tell me, "You haven't seen poverty." You right. Know? I mean, they were. And I can remember him telling me how much his father appreciated the New Deal and how some, not all, but some African Americans were able to see the benefit of that policy. Now, I wish, obviously, it would have stretched more broad, but that's just an example of how I believe that government can have a direct impact on the quality of life of people in a Mm -hmm. positive way. Now, unfortunately, we're in a space now in the state of Ohio where it is not, but... I think if we continue to fight and not get complacent, tomorrow always has a promise of being better than today and yesterday. If you could fix something down there, what would you like to fix? You got one thing. You're going to say, Terrence, we're going to give you one thing you can fix. I would start with local government funding. Because, listen, before I got elected, and you know this, I was an intern on Cleveland City Council. I worked Mm -hmm. out of Jeff Johnson's office. He was my boss. Mm -hmm. And I worked very closely with Mike Palenzik. Okay. I saw directly the impact of those local government funds being cut, I saw the direct impact that had on the city's ability to create certain city services. Every budget cycle, they had to fight like hell to get dollars for their award. Mm -hmm. And it just made it difficult. And I saw that directly. I mean, if we can get local government funding back, that will have a huge impact on not just Cleveland, but Northeast Ohio, because we can Mm -hmm. really begin to do some things that we have not been able to do. Interesting. All right, man. Well, I want to thank you for coming on our program. You you did a great job. You got some good information out. This is a place for you guys to always come in and tell us about what's going on. You are my plug for sure for the state house now because we don't have too many people left, as you say, to even come talk to us about what's going on. We want to talk more about the OLBC when you come back. Absolutely. Speaking of that, are you thinking about doing some leadership in OLBC? The Ohio Legislative Black Caucus, for my viewers who don't know what that means. Sure. Are you, what's that? I, I'm involved in leadership. I currently serve as the treasurer. My job is to make sure our money's straight and to help us raise money. Mm-hmm. And I have a very good working relationship with not just our current president, my colleague, Representative Brent, but our former president, my mm-hmm. colleague, Representative mm-hmm. Tom West. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right now, our biggest push right now is increasing the black vote, increasing mm-hmm. black voter turnout, because it's vital. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things at stake that will have a direct impact on the black family in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the capacity I serve in right now as treasurer. 
What other committees are you on? Are you on any committees down there? Yeah, I'm, so I'm on health, I'm a workforce development, and I serve as ranking member. Shout out to former leader Amelia Sykes for appointing me as ranking member. I mm-hmm. looked out for me. Okay. And we got to send her to Congress, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so health, economic workforce development, I'm on the insurance committee, and mm-hmm. I'm on the public utilities committee. Okay. All right. Yep. So on that public utilities committee, you are watching the rates of all these utilities and everything that's happening? I, that was one committee that I wanted to be on. And I asked Leader Sykes at the time to put me on that committee because I'm committed to doing the work and I'm committed to putting Ohio on the right side of history. And, you know, unfortunately, Ohio has not always gotten it right when we talk about our environmental future. When we talk about public utilities, we have not always got it right and we have not always been on the right side of history. Um, and we're not always going to get it right. And I've made some mistakes in the legislature too. And if there were some things I could do differently, there I would definitely, I can definitely look at some decisions I've made and may not have been the best decision to make at the time. So that was one committee that I wanted to really get on and roll my sleeves up and do the work. So we got to continue the work. The work never stops. No, man. Well, this is what we do at the end of our show. What we like to do is we like to give you an opportunity to look right there into that camera and it gives you a moment to Tell everybody about what's happening in Terrence's life right now, how they can get in contact with you, how they can get in contact with your campaign. Thanks for having me, Kenny. State Rep Up Church here. Uh, I've been fighting for the 10th House District for the past three and a half years. It's been the greatest honor of my life. Still a lot more work to do. We've been able to get a lot of things done, and I want to continue to get a lot of things done. So I hope that you all would consider voting to reelect me to serve the 20th House District and continue the work that we've done. If you want to reach out to me, you can obviously call my office in Columbus or send my office an email. If you want to reach out to my campaign, you can send me an email at offeruptchurch at gmail.com. Or you can look me up on Twitter. My handle is tupchurch216. Or you can look me up on Instagram, rep underscore upchurch. All right. We want to thank you again for coming out. Again, this is a place that we come to hear information. Like I said, you are a guy. For downstate, we need to know what's going on, Absolutely. and you're going to be the guy to come in. So in about a month or so, we'll be looking for you to come back and tell us what's happening, maybe right after your election. Election's in August, so. Listen, uh, I'm happy we'll to come out. in here. If I'm reelected, I'm more than happy to come in here and tell you what's going on and what I look to do in term three. Mm-hmm. If not, I could give you <laughs> some suggestions of who you may want to call to come down and talk to you. <laughs> we appreciate you, bro. Absolutely. All right.